Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, my name is Laura Winnie. I'm the Education and Community Engagement Coordinator for DuPage County Animal Services. And today we're gonna talk about our feathered friends, specifically wildlife. So we're gonna talk about common Chicago land wildlife birds. We're gonna talk about how to be helpful to our resident birds. And then we'll go over ways to avoid conflict humanely, and also who to call if we have questions or a problem. Now, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to throw them into the chat box. I will check that at the end. The program should last a little under an hour and we'll have a little bit of time at the end for any questions, but feel free to throw them into the chat box at any time. I am going to make sure that everybody else is muted because I am recording this presentation to throw up on YouTube at a later date and Zoom gets a little funky when there are multiple microphones on at the same time. Um, also, I'm going to throw up a survey at the end of the presentation in the chat box. We're always looking for new ideas for programs and ways to improve our existing programs. So I will remind you about that at the end. Please fill that out. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, when we talk about wildlife, we, we want to talk about the usual ones that we get a call about at DuPage County Animal Services. Uh, it's not that we've never gotten calls about cardinals and hummingbirds, but generally those aren't the ones people are calling us about. Instead, we're talking about birds and wildlife that are causing problems for people, nuisance issues, property damage, um, either from feces or birds hunting for food and causing some problems. So we're going to start by identifying birds who tend to cause some conflict. Then we're going to talk about some other common birds found in our area just for fun. So of course I had to start off with probably the most recognizable bird in our area, which is the Canada goose. And there are actually seven subspecies of geese. And there are many that migrate through here, but it's the giant Canada goose. Uh, that's the only one known to breed in Illinois. So they are pretty much here year round. They are very large birds. They can reach up to 24 pounds, which is very impressive. And they are, as I said, a year-long resident. However, when the winter weather is severe, they can migrate as needed. It's not as frequent and it's for not as long a period of time as other geese species and subspecies. And they can actually go up to 30 days between feedings, uh, especially if there's that huge snow layer in the way because they like those nice big open plains lots of lawn space where they can get to that grass and those bugs. So when we have those deep piles of snow and it's been there for longer than 30 days, they can migrate to areas where there's snow melt and they can get to their food. But as long as our winters stay mild, they're pretty much permanent residents. They don't need to move on as long as they can get to their food. And they are really impressive animals. Uh, many, many people find them very annoying. I know my brother is one. And the more I learn about them, the more impressed I am with them. Uh, their iconic thing is that V formation when they are flying. And it's all about aerodynamics. So the way the V formation works is that each bird is lower in altitude than the one before it. So they kind of do a step stair down. The one at the point, the one at the very front is the highest up and is taking on that headwind, which is the hardest thing to do. Each bird behind is just kind of drafting on the airflow, just kind of hanging out. It's not nearly as labor intensive to be on that airflow than it is to actually break the headwind. So when that first bird gets tired, then you'll see it break off and it'll go to the back, which is the easiest position. 
And one of the others will swoop up and take that head position. And they take turns that way so that they can fly for very long periods of time. They can fly up to 1,500 miles in a day, and they can reach speeds of 70 miles an hour, which is just so, so cool. And also, they're very impressive swimmers. So water is extremely important to these birds because when they go through that molting period, when they're losing their feathers and changing out their feathers, that makes them unable to fly. So in order to evade predators, they have to go into the water. That's why you typically tend to see geese near larger bodies of water because that's where they're going to feel safer, where they have those two options, flying, and if they can't fly, go into the water to get away from predators. Those baby geese, those cute little ugly goslings, learn to swim within 24 hours of hatching and within that first day can actually dive 30 to 40 feet down into the water, which is really cool. Now, as cool as that is, they can still cause us some issues. Um, most likely they're gonna be a problem when there's a larger groups of them. That's when you tend to see accumulations of things that we'd rather not see on our sidewalks or our lawns, all that nice good stuff. And a lot of times this happens around nesting sites. So geese mate for life. They will be with the same mate for 10 to 25 years. And only when one partner dies, will that other bird try to find a new mate. So they're in it for the long haul. And because of that, they go back to the same nesting sites year after year. Once they found a great place, they're gonna go back there. Now, where they've successfully nested and where they're hanging out, times, you may see several breeding pairs in the same area because it's kind of like the cool spot at the mall, if anybody remembers malls. Uh, you look to see where it was busy, right? Because if there was no line at a place in the food court, your best bet was that that place wasn't good, right? Like their food was off or something was going on. Like, ooh, why is no one there? So when you saw a long line, you're like, oh, that's got to be worth it. Everybody wants to go there. I'm going to go there too. And that's when you see these larger groups of birds all congregating in the same area because one pair has found it successful, two and three pairs have found it successful, and now everybody wants in on the really cool nesting place. So that's when we see a lot of that fecal matter build up. That's when the sidewalks get really, really gross. And that's also where we tend to have more of a problem with males being protective of their nests and also their young. So they are not a bird that's gonna back down. If they feel threatened, they will make a hissing sound, which is kind of funny if it wasn't so scary because they are a large bird and people are rightly afraid of large birds because they can hurt. I have never heard of a geese fatality, uh, but that doesn't mean that you want to invite being nipped or chased by a goose, especially small children need to be concerned because it can hurt. You know, they, they do have strong bills and that's never a fun scenario. They can leave bruises, they can break the skin. And that's typically what's happening is when they're acting aggressive is they are protecting a space that is theirs and specifically their young. So an important thing to remember about all of this is, and we're gonna talk about this more extensively later. We want to try to deter geese from nesting in an area that's important to us in the first place. Because once you get that first breeding pair, it's going to be more and more attractive. And you need to actively work on making the area unattractive so that they find somewhere else that's more acceptable in a forest preserve or someplace else. It's important to remember that they are a protected species. So most of the birds we're gonna talk about are protected one way or another. Uh, Canadian geese are protected from the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this comes all the way back from when uh, women used to wear feathers in their hair and especially migratory birds, and it was just decimating the populations. So we're talking over a hundred years of protective status. 
And that's one of the reasons why we see so many of these particular birds is they are protected. And also a lot of their natural predators have moved out of the area. So wolves, coyotes, foxes, they're not as common as they used to be, which means the birds have more free reign, more of them survive gustling hood and can go on. So we will talk more extensively about how to deter geese and other birds from getting comfortable. And that's gonna be one of the key ways is how do we make the place uncomfortable? Another very common problem that we hear about at DCAS is woodpeckers. And there are seven types found in Illinois. Uh, three are mostly migratory. You'll see them seasonally, but four we have year round. So looking at the top pictures, we have the downy and the hairy woodpeckers. All of these woodpeckers have a little bit of red on their head. So the one you see on the top that does not have red, that's a female. So excuse me, all the males have red on their head. So that's a female hairy woodpecker. The one next to it on top is a male downy woodpecker. And they are very hard to tell apart. You can see that the feathering, the coloration of the feathers is very, very similar. You need to look at their bills. So the hairy woodpecker is going to have a nice longer bill. They're also gonna be quite a bit bigger than the downy woodpecker. On the bottom there, we have the red-bellied and the pleated woodpeckers. So on the left, I know it's called red-bellied, not actually very red-bellied, not the way like an American robin is. Uh, it's much easier to distinguish it from its red cap and then the striping along the back side there. Uh, they will get a little blush of coloration seasonally during breeding season on their chest, but I don't, I don't know who named them red-bellied, but uh, they, they were really exaggerating that. I think they really wanted to give this woodpecker something to be proud of and red cap just didn't sound as cool. Uh, all of these woodpeckers can cause potential property destruction. That's the main reason we hear about them. Sometimes it's not for the reason we think it is. So we've all heard that woodpeckers are drilling into wood inciting because you have bugs. And if they're drilling into your wood inciting, if they're hammering away at it, that means your house has bugs. Well, not necessarily. Uh, sometimes they just like the way it sounds and they're using it as like a drum roll for a mating call. So even if your house has bugs and you get rid of the bugs, that may not necessarily stop a woodpecker if that's not the reason they're doing it in the first place. Now, absolutely, they will do it to get to food. They can hear the invertebrates behind, especially like wood siding uh, is very popular, especially with some of our older homes or even just some of our, you know, like outdoor structures that maybe are a little bit more cheaply built. They're gonna try to get to that food source. They're also potential damaging to trees on our property and other wooden structures. So I've even heard of them going after like old swing sets and things like that. Uh, they really like going after softer woods, which makes perfect sense. Why would you bang your face against something that was really, really hard when you could bang your face against something that's softer? Makes sense, right? So leaving a dead tree on your property is ideal if you have woodpeckers in your area because that's something that will draw them in to use one for those mating calls and two to get any bugs that are living inside that dead tree. If you remove it and you still have woodpeckers in the area, they're just going to find an alternative somewhere else close by. And sometimes that's something you own and you really don't want them to go after. Uh, they will also burrow into for nesting holes, things like that. So once we get to that point, their nest can get pretty large sized, I would say, you know, about it was around uh, maybe apple sized around to get in there. And even if 
like I said, you have that dead tree and you have abandoned woodpecker nests, we really don't want to take down that tree because other bird species will use abandoned woodpecker nests. So they do all the work and then other birds benefit from it, which is very, very nice. So moving on to some non-native animals, the next three birds that we talk about are not protected. So I told you that most of the animals we talked about are protected in one way or another. These are not. So these all come from Europe. It's the starlings, the house sparrows, and pigeons. So they often outcompete native birds for resources. Uh, starlings were purposefully introduced in New York in the 1890s. I couldn't find any specific information on why, but my guess is, is because they're pretty. They have nice speckled black with white, which is how they got their name, the starling. Uh, during the winter, during summer, during breeding, they get these like iridescent colors around their necks, both males and females. So their plumage is very, very attractive. And it didn't take very long, about 30 years, for them to make it over from New York into Illinois. And they are one of our most abundant birds. Uh, if you see a black speck flying around, especially if you see a cloud of black specks flying around, chances are it's a starling. So we'll talk about that in just a second. They can cause some issues because they tend to be in large groups and exposure to their nesting material or to their droppings can lead to illness. So they do carry zoonotic diseases, diseases that can pass between animals and humans. Um, one is histoplasmosis, which is a fungal infection. So even if you're like trying to clean something and you breathe in the spores, that can cause an issue. And they also cause uh, the bacteria that causes salmonella. So definitely, definitely, anytime we come across these animals, we wanna make sure that we are masking up, gloving up, washing vigorously after we handle a potential contaminant because it's always better to be safe than sorry. Now their nesting sites can also cause an issue just because they tend to outcompete with our native birds. And there are even reports of starlings taking over nests of native birds and basically evicting them from the nest that they built, which is never, never fun. Um, I did mention their large numbers and I do wanna show you guys a video. It's called a murmuration, which is hilarious. So let's see if I can get this video to play. So that's when you see those moving clouds of blackbirds and you're just not quite sure because from this distance you can't see that speckled plumage you can't see the iridescence it's just it looks like something from an Alfred Hitchcock movie to be quite honest and they can cause quite a problem in farms uh, they will settle in these big big groups and those droppings can cause problems to livestock and also just the amount of devastation that they do on plants and insects and uh, the plants that have the insects can be uh, quite devastating. Now our next invasive species that we want to talk about is house sparrows and these are, I equate them to, these are the squirrels of the bird world because they have figured out that humans mean food, mean shelter, mean safety, and they figured out that living near us is awesome. And you're gonna see them in very large flocks. It can be from a few individuals to a few hundred individuals. So when I say that they're large flocks, I mean large flocks. And they are very persistent nesters. So even if you find a nest in an area and you're like, oh, I don't want them nesting here, I'll get rid of it. The next day it's gonna be back. So you have to remove the nest again and again and again. And it can take quite a while for them to finally get sick of constantly rebuilding their nest and finding another location. So it takes a lot of patience on our end because they do tend to nest in areas that we really don't want them to be in. Uh, crooks and crannies around our houses. I've seen them in dryer vent holes. 
uh, if there's even the like a three quarter of an inch hole in your siding, they're going to be in there or in your softening up to your attic. They're going to be up there as well. So these are cavity nesting birds. They want to be in a space that's mostly enclosed or at least partially covered. And unfortunately, they will outcompete. They are very persistent. And again, just like our starlings, they will take over spots and bully our native birds into giving them spots. So if you have bird nesting boxes, definitely want to make sure what birds are in those nesting boxes. And if it is sparrows, eventually they will decide to move on to another spot and you will be able to get in some native birds, but it's gonna take a lot of time and that's gonna work best in a backyard that only has one nesting box because it would be very, very hard to monitor every single one and to make sure that it's a sparrow's nest that you're dealing with and not another one. Remember, these aren't protected birds, so you can take out their nests, you can um, harass them a little bit, you can get them to move on because they are not protected and they are really, really invasive and rather harmful to our native birds. But it can be tricky to tell the difference between a sparrow's nest and another bird's nest. So you really need to be very, very diligent. These birds are also professional beggars and thieves. There are news reports of sparrows figuring out how automatic doors work and walking in with humans to convenience stores and stealing bird seed or even just food that's available. Uh, if you're ever in a restaurant and you see a bird flying around inside the restaurant, chances are it's a sparrow waiting for someone to leave an unsuspecting French fry. Uh, they're also typically the ones that are gonna be begging for food if you're walking through the park, something like that. They are just, they're not really wary of humans at all. And they're, they've realized that, oh, humans mean food. And that's one of the reasons why they're able to persist when some of our native birds who are more wary of us have not. Another common one that we get questions about is pigeons. So my, my mother hates pigeons. She calls them rats with wings. And I, I hate that because I think they're really pretty. They are a member of the dove family. Uh, they definitely don't get the love that doves do. And I just think they're really interesting. They can be in medium sized herds. So about 10 to 20 will be in a flock. Sorry, not a herd, a flock. Uh, they've been here a really long time. So they were introduced over here in the 1600s. Uh, so they've been here longer than a lot of people have been over here. And they are an important food source for predatory birds. So, I mean, pigeons are here to stay. They have a place in the food cycle, uh, peregrine falcons especially tend to like pigeons uh, for unknown reasons. I can't ask them, so I don't really know. And the main cause for concern is going to be their droppings. Where you tend to have pigeons, you tend to have a lot of droppings. Uh, if anybody ever watched Frasier in the day, Niles Crane said it best, I don't care for pigeons, they have no respect for public art, which is true, wherever they are, is where they're gonna go, okay? And unfortunately, those droppings can carry disease that could be transmitted to us. So toxoplasmosis, which is also the same thing that's found in kitty feces, so it's uh, not pleasant, and salmonella, all right? So those are both things that can cause problems for humans. It's when they accumulate and harden over time that's going to be very, very hard. Uh, the toxoplasmosis especially takes a couple days to develop in the feces. So it's where it's accumulated that you need to be most careful. But again, always, 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 if you are trying to clean up after some of these animals, make sure you're wearing protective equipment. Their accumulated droppings are also corrosive. So a lot of the stains that you see on public statues or on sidewalks do come from accumulated pigeon droppings. Uh, there's a little bit of acid in there that just, it, it's not great. And 
These are opportunistic feeders. So you will see them around garbage cans. They do tend to congregate most where there is a known food source. So if they are congregating in your neighborhood, you need to identify why. What is the thing that is attracting them there? Is someone feeding them on a regular basis? Have they discovered a bird feeder that's easy access for them? Have they discovered a grain store? Maybe you have a farmer in the area or someone that keeps chickens and the chicken feed is left exposed for whatever reason and they have found it. So understanding why they're there will help you prevent large accumulations from them. Typically one or two pigeons isn't going to cause enough of a problem where it would warrant intervention. It's when you're gonna get these large flocks of birds that are going to be an issue. Other common birds that we have in the area year long, we have mallards, other duck species, uh, various gull species. I always love it when people are like, oh, a seagull. Well, we're not really near a sea but it's a gull. So yes, it's a water bird and there are large bodies of water nearby. Um, corvids, crows, blue jays, also other songbirds, American robins, northern cardinals, goldfinches, and chickadees are ones that you're going to see year round. Uh, during the summer, we're going to have some of those migratory birds come through, uh, the red-winged blackbird, herons, chimney swift, and our ruby-throated hummingbird. We are actually right on the end of hummingbird season. So if you have a hummingbird feeder, you know, use it now because by mid-October, that's when they've typically moved on. Uh, you can see them sometimes like starting in June through the end of October, but really August and September is going to be the main times for seeing them and when to provide that extra little bit of encouragement to come to your house. Predatory birds we have in the area. I love birds of prey. I think they are so cool. Uh, raptors is just a diverse group for a bunch of these birds of prey. So owls here in the area, we have barn screech, barred, and great horned owl. So we have a barred owl here in this picture and you can see how I got the name. It looks like there are bars going through the plumage there. For hawks, the most common ones are coopers and red-tailed. Uh, we will get red shoulders and other species as well, but they tend to be not necessarily year-long residents. They're more on the edge coming through. Uh, we do have the peregrine falcon and it is Chicago's official city bird, which is really neat. They were pretty much extinct for a long time in this area. They had been hunted um, out of existence and they are starting to make a comeback. There are groups that are working to reintroduce peregrine falcons to various areas around Chicagoland, including Lincoln Park. And then they are monitoring those birds to look for health and any dangers and other things to help encourage that population to grow back up. And of course, eagles. So the most well-known eagle, at least here in America, the bald eagle is one that we're gonna see here in the Chicagoland area. However, they're typically going to be more out near large bodies of water. They are fishing birds. So that's their prey of choice. They will go. And if you've ever seen a video, I wish I had thought to put one in. It's very, very cool when they swoop in and catch a fish and take it up in their talons. It's very neat. Um, and they do tend to nest in very, very tall trees. So Standing Rock to the west of us has uh, some really great places for sightings for bald eagles because that's like their perfect habitat out there near that, near the river with those really tall undisturbed trees. And I do like to mention that the bald eagle is a real environmental success story. In the seventies, when we were spraying DDT everywhere to deal with mosquito populations, it caused a lot of problems in bird populations. So it was one of those unforeseen consequences to human action. And what's great is they realized it and they stopped it. So DDT was banned. It had been causing a thinning of the eggshell 
so that the eggs could not survive till hatching. That was the main issue with DDT, is it thinned those eggshells. And once they realized that, they banned DDT, and a lot of these birds made a fabulous comeback, including the bald eagle. So I always like to talk about how, yes, sometimes environmental activism does what it's supposed to do and saves these animals from our own mistakes, which is fabulous. It's always good to learn from your own mistakes, including mistakes that we sometimes make thinking we're helping. And we love to help. Humans love to help wild animals, especially the cute little ones, right? Uh, we think it's great. But unfortunately, sometimes our help is more harmful than we realize. So it's important to understand when these animals need help, okay, and what we can do about that. So I have here seven simple actions to help birds. This is from the Cornell Society, and it's great. We're going to talk about some of them in detail, uh, the make windows safe and the keep cats indoors. But a few of the other ones I want to talk about is uh, doing citizen science. This is a fabulous way to get involved. If you are a bird watcher anyway, if you love watching birds, 100% look into citizen science. This is a way for ordinary people, ordinary citizens, to be the eyes and ears of scientists. So basically, we help them do their field work. So there are lots of different apps out there. You can just go to citizen science. I think it's citizenscience.org. You can Google it and look for migratory bird apps, backyard birds, and you just enter in what you see, who you see, what, you know, what day it was, and you're helping scientists track these bird populations so that they can take all that information from all these citizens around the US and around the world, really, and put it into a computer and look for patterns and see like, oh, well, there used to be a lot of Orioles in this area and now there aren't any more. What's going on? Or, oh, I've noticed that there is an increase in the Northern Cardinal population. I wonder why that is. And then they can start to look for some of those unforeseen consequences of human actions that are affecting the environment and what adjustments we may need to make. So I highly recommend doing citizen science. It's super fun uh, and it, really you're being part of a global community helping out these animals. Uh, looking at other things, we definitely want to avoid pesticides as much as possible for many, many different reasons. Um, when we are taking out insects and we are killing these insects using chemicals, a lot of times those chemicals get ingested by the birds or we are taking away their food source. So we need to find other ways to get rid of these nuisance insects that we don't want in order to make sure that we're not inadvertently causing problems up the food chain. We wanna look at shade grown coffee. Coffee, when it is grown, a lot of times they will just completely level out a forest. And even though that may not be something that directly affects us right here in Illinois, it does affect the greater community for birds, uh, the greater global community of birds. So uh, looking for shade grown coffee where they are not completely destroying those ecosystems is going to be very, very helpful as well. Using less plastic is just something I always recommend because it's kind of hard for animals to differentiate between shiny iridescent beagle beetle and shiny iridescent plastic toy so a lot of times these animals are ingesting plastics they feel full but they starve to death because they haven't actually taken in any nutrients so this is a problem throughout the world every ecosystem has this issue from sea turtles to fish to birds in the sky. So less plastic is always the way to go. And this is something that I feel very strongly about. If you'd like some recommendations on how to reduce the plastic in your life, I am more than happy to help. I've worked at a couple different zoos and aquariums that always had great practical tips on reducing plastic in your life. So another thing 
that we don't necessarily think about will help our birds is using native plants because native plants are going to attract those native insects and those native birds. Okay, so the plants and bugs and birds that are all supposed to be together, if we're taking out the one, it, it goes up the chain, it takes out the others as well. So the more native plants that we can have in our gardens, the better, and really just less lawn, less grass in general is going to be better for these animals, especially for our animals that our birds that are more fruit oriented. So providing those berry yielding bushes that, you know, maybe we took out and put in a holly bush or something that's not necessarily native. Still pretty. Look into native alternatives that can provide sustenance for these lovely animals. Okay, so going more in detail about when these animals need our help. We want to think about if we see an injured animal, we want to make sure that we do call it in, okay? Sometimes it's still best to leave an injured animal out where it is. Unfortunately, nature is not always kind, but we want to do the best of the worst options, if that makes sense. The an animal that can still move around might get injured further if we're trying to chase it, okay? So if the animal, the bird is still ambulatory, if it can still get around, it's going to be better left on its own than the stress of having a human being chase it with a net or something like that. Um, so we definitely want to call in injuries, but we also need to understand that sometimes humans intervening is going to cause more problems than solve. And that's just an unfortunate part of nature that we need to make our peace with. Now, if you do see a deceased animal, you can call that in, but it is important to dispose of it because if it died of a communicable disease between other birds, we don't want other birds to come to that area, we don't want them to be infected. So if you have a dead bird in your yard, bag it up, put it out with the trash. I know that's not a very uh, elegant method of disposal, but that is the recommended. Please, please, please protect yourself. Again, remember that these animals can carry diseases that can transfer to humans. Nobody wants that. Now, if we see an animal that is unresponsive or unconscious, but you can see that it's breathing, you know, it's been knocked out with birds, maybe it flew into a window, something like that. Um, be careful about approaching it because a startled animal can cause a lot of harm on us if you don't have that professional training on how to handle them. So contact a professional about what to do. Now, if you see a broken wing or other severe injury, something very obvious, that's where you want to call in, again, another professional. Um, if you can contain it, that's going to be the best thing. So if you see a bird that has a broken wing and it's kind of hopping around, if you can like, you know, toss a laundry basket over it to keep it in one space. That's going to be better for the professionals that are responding because, again, then they're not causing undue stress to that animal by chasing it around a larger area, potentially causing further harm. If it is trapped or caught, or maybe you just think it's trapped, I would highly recommend that you do seek professional help there because it's possible that the bird has sustained injuries while it was trapped. And if we just free it, we're not necessarily freeing it to a positive outcome unless someone has assessed it. So something to keep in mind. Uh, as I mentioned, these animals may have communicable diseases to us or to others. A uh, parasite, sometimes you can actually see uh, swollen areas where mites, uh, flea, um, fly larvae have gone underneath the skin. It's very, very patchy and swollen. Uh, avian conjunctivitis, also known as house finch disease, is where it's conjunctivitis. It's an eye disease. So their eyes have a very bad discharge. So you can see here in the picture on the left is normal finch eye, on the right 
is one that has conjunctivitis. And it does get to the point where it cements the eyelid shut and causes blindness. So this is something where a professional would be able to intervene, but it is highly recommended that only wildlife rehabilitators who have the proper training do this, okay? So we're gonna talk more about organizations that can help later on, but this is something to be concerned about if you see birds that have this closed or swollen eye because it is transmittable to other birds, even other bird species. Salmonella is another one that can cause significant problems. So we wanna make sure that we are doing our best to provide good environments where we're not encouraging the spread of this. So again, if you have, if you have found a dead bird in your backyard, I am so sorry, but it is best to dispose of it as soon as possible so that whatever happened to that bird does not get spread to another bird, to uh, maybe a pet living in your household, to any kids or adults living in your household as well. So what are some things that we do that may cause some harm if we're not careful? Well, feeders. Feeders are awesome, okay? They provide loads of entertainment. I absolutely love bird feeders, but sometimes, we're not doing our proper research and we're causing some conflicts and we're not even aware of it. So looking at this picture, that is a lot of birds on one bird feeder. And I don't know if you've noticed, they are all house sparrows. So it's very possible that in this particular instance, the house sparrows have taken over this particular feeder and are forcing all other native birds out. So they are they're mean girls, they've taken over the source of food, okay? And if you see something like this, if you see a feeder that has an insane amount of bird activity, it's always best to have different feeders, different styles, different levels, and different type of food, because that way you're appealing to the broadest audience possible. And also you're preventing this sense of territorial ownership over the one food source that's available right there. Crowded bird feeders like this are just a wealth of bacteria and germs. So that is one of the ways that some of those diseases spread. Also, if we are not properly cleaning our bird feeders. So in the summer, it's recommended to clean out our bird feeders completely once a week during the winter, every two weeks. Okay, and you want to use a bleach solution. Some say, you know, 10 parts water, one part bleach, nine parts water. Just check uh, with the recommended manufacturer. I recommend getting a bird feeder that can go in the dishwasher because that makes it super easy and you can just put it on your hottest setting to get rid of anything. Okay, so understanding that birds are clean but they may not be as clean as we would hope and we need to help them out a little bit. Uh, this is another area where parasites can get into the area. So again, I would recommend when you're dealing with an area where wild animals are, even bird feeders, make sure you're wearing gloves, okay? Just to make sure that nothing that was left behind by a bird comes and affects you. Bird feeders can also cause a problem with poor nutrition. It is very, very important that we do our research. And I actually wrote it here three times, research, 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 because different birds have different nutritional needs at different times of year. So suet is a very popular option. That's basically beef fat and a thing. That's great for the winter for some species. Some people will put it out during the summer and then that beef fat gets rancid and can cause lots of issues. And it can also attract, hmm, maybe not who you were hoping would come to your bird feeder. So making sure that you're using a reputable source, don't just go to the place where you buy bird food and ask them because chances are they just wanna sell you bird food and they don't really care if what you're looking for is what they have. They're just trying to make that sale. 
and maybe they don't know, okay? Salespeople are awesome, but sometimes they're not as well informed as we would hope. So the National Audubon Society has a fabulous website and lots of recommendations on feeder placement, what will attract different types of birds, and also different types of feeders to help eliminate those invasive species. So if you do have like this bullying situation going on, you get one of those feeders that's meant to prevent squirrels from getting in. Some of those birds are a little bit larger, like those pigeons, and it works just like with the squirrels. It closes the door and it doesn't let them, as opposed to the chickadee, who maybe you do want to invite in, they're nice and light and it doesn't close the door and they can feed from there. So there's lots of great options there. Highly recommend that you check out National Audubon Society. Their website is a wealth of information. And if I tried to cover even a fraction of it, we would be here all night. So definitely check it out. Another situation where we may be causing harm when we're trying to be helpful is when we see a orphaned, and I say that in quotes, baby bird. Because taking baby birds out of the wild really decreases their chances of a positive outcome. Baby birds are really hard to rehabilitate. And a lot of times what we see is not what we think it is. Baby birds are left alone for large portions of the day and mom and dad only come back for feeding. So if they are in their nest and they're looking good, leave them alone. Keep a look out for mom. Uh, depending on where the nest is, sometimes you can sprinkle a little bit of flour a little bit, you know, to see if it's been disturbed, like if it's in a feeder box, something like that. Uh, if you have cameras, definitely put them in because that's super fun. But you'll be surprised by how little you see mom and dad. They are definitely not hovering parents, okay? They are doing their own thing. They're taking care of them. And then they're coming back and taking care of babies. So we want to make sure that if we are monitoring the nest, that we are doing so from a safe distance where mom isn't going to feel like she's threatened. We don't want to scare mom away. We also want to know when that baby is independent. So there are three main stages for baby birds. There's hatchling, and that's when their eyes are closed and they're bald. Okay, so that's really easy. That's like legit right out of the egg. Then there's nestling. Their eyes are open a little bit. They're starting to get some little feathers, but there's still a lot of skin showing. Then there's fledgling. And fledgling is fully feathered, eyes are open, they're alert. Their tail feathers and their wing feathers might be a little bit shorter than an adult and they may, they may look a little weird. They may act a little weird, but they're just learning how to bird. So this happens a lot when we see them on the ground. So if you see a fully feathered, ridiculous looking little bird and it's hopping around or like trying to fly and it keeps falling, it's just trying to learn how to be a bird. Typically mom and dad are nearby watching out at this point, okay? They're trying to monitor the situation. You might even see mom and dad come and provide food for the fledgling while they're on the ground. This is a very, very important developmental step for them. We do not want to intervene. So absolutely, you can monitor them from a distance, but you don't want to interfere, okay? Now, if you see one of those hatchlings or nestlings, so they don't have their full feathers yet, maybe their eyes aren't quite open yet, and they are out of the nest, it is okay to put them back in the nest. It is a myth that mama birds will reject babies if we touch them. Uh, birds don't have a great sense of smell, so the odds of them detecting us on their babies is pretty minuscule anyway. Uh, the main thing here is that we don't want to hover, so we want to put baby back in the nest if we know where it is, and then we want to move on. If the nest is destroyed or it is too high an area for you to get to, you can make a temporary nest just out of, gosh, like a berry basket or a, you know, wooden basket, something, a bowl, and put grass in it, okay, 
form like a little nest area, put bird in, and then attach it to the tree as close as you can to the original nest site or near where you found baby bird. Try to get it nice and high so that nothing can mess with it. And then again, you can monitor it from there to see if mom comes back because mom will recognize baby, okay? They are, they're pretty good moms. And the worst thing that we can do is take a baby whose mom is available and take the baby away from mom who wants to provide care because mom is always gonna provide better care than we can. Also, it is illegal for us to take wild animals into our home, especially for these protected species, okay? Wild animals belong to the state of Illinois, which is really weird sounding, but it's true. And it is illegal to have wild animals inside your home, even for a brief period of time. Now, if we see a baby in distress, even one of those fledglings, and it is covered in fly eggs, it kind of looks like rice stuck to the feathers. If it is has a severe injury, if you can see something wrong with it, if it is cold, if it's wet, if it's crying all the time, if you haven't seen mom in a while, then yes, that's when it's time to intervene. Possibly something has happened to mom or dad and they are unable to provide care. So at that point, we call in one of those professional rehabilitators. Okay, so a big idea behind, a big problem for birds is our large plate glass windows. They don't understand what glass is and they will collide with it and they can cause serious injuries or fatalities to themselves. So using decals or even a film on glass will help break it up for the birds so that they understand what's going on. Um, having shades drawn or blinds is going to be helpful. Even placing outdoor plants near these large windows so that there's a little bit of a block and also so that there's a alternative place for the birds to perch is going to help. If you have indoor plants by these windows, it can be very confusing because the bird may be trying to get to that plant through the window. So keeping it a little further away from the window or having something in between to block that bird's view. So that film or something like that. If you have reflective windows that reflect the landscaping outside, having furniture or something in between to break up that reflection so that, again, they don't think that they're just zooming right through into another forest. And anything you can do to make it obvious that there's something else going on, okay? That's going to be very, very helpful. One of those big things is that we can do is keeping our cats indoors. Cats are probably the most harmful invasive species to birds in the world. On average, in the US alone, just the US, every year cats kill 2.4 billion birds. Billion, it sounds insane because it is. And cats, just house cats, are credited with the extinction of 63 animals, including a lot of bird species. They wiped out the population of these animals completely on the world and they're no more. So cats are insanely good hunters and it does not matter if your cat is super well-fed, okay? It doesn't really have to do with hunting. It is an instinct. It's like when you're on a roller coaster and you have your hands up and you see a beam coming and you just, oh, you duck, right? I mean, you know that you're not going to hit your hands or your head on that beam, but the instinct is to protect yourself. The instinct is to do the thing, okay? Just like with cats. They see a bird. They want to chase it. They want to get it. Even if they're full, even if they just had dinner, okay? It has very little to do with hunger and all about those predatory instincts that have been with them for tens of thousands of years. And making sure that we are containing our cats indoors is going to protect those bird species. Now, if we do have outdoor cats, so if you have some in your neighborhood, there can be a couple of things that you can do. One, we want to make sure that we are monitoring any feral cat populations. So any cat colonies living in old barns, garages, something like that, because we want to do a trap neuter release, TNR. And that will help 
decrease the overall feral cat population by preventing the cats that are already out there from continuously having litters. If, for instance, you have a neighbor who has an outdoor cat because they love being outside, uh, there are some fun ways that you can help keep your the birds safe in your neighborhood by gifting your neighbors with bird safe collars. So bells are good, but what's better is called a bird called a bird safe collar. And it's basically, it kind of looks like a clown fringe and it's super colorful because birds respond very well to colors, bright colors. And it makes it harder for the cat to sneak up on the bird. And they're cute. So as long as you present it in a, hey, I got this for your cat, it's for cute. And then you can also tell them the benefits of the cat wearing it, okay? Um, it doesn't hurt the cat at all. It just makes them less successful at hunting. It found out, uh, a study showed that wearing those bright little clown collars decreased their hunting by 87%, which is huge. Uh, bells only did 47%. So bells are great, you know, that's nice. But those big flashy colors is going to be much more efficient. Any adoptable stray cats that you see living outside, they need to be brought in. So they need to be brought in either to a shelter where they can be adopted out to a home that will keep them inside, or there needs to be discussions with whoever is responsible for them to make sure that they understand what's going on. Um, cats can be trained to walk on a leash. They can go out in little carriers. They can go out in little um, baby buggies. So they can find ways to enjoy the outdoors that still keeps birds safe. Catios is a great way. I have a screened in front porch and my cat's favorite thing to do is to sit out there in the morning and watch the rabbits go by. She loves it. She can't do anything about it, which is great because I love the rabbits, but she loves just being out there and seeing it. And I know that the rabbits are going to stay safe and that she's going to stay safe because I know exactly where she is. Okay, so I am so sorry. We are going a little over time. I'm going to power through all this. Uh, we're almost to the end, so please bear with me, stick with me, okay? We're going to talk about next, uh, one of the things that is very near and dear to my heart, how do we deal with conflicts with birds? You know, we love them, but we don't necessarily want them living in our attics, so what can we do about it? An ounce of prevention goes a long, long way, and this is key here. Remember when I talked about those can Canada geese? making sure that we are deterring them from nesting in the first place because once they're established it's a lot harder battle so this is going to be key exclusionary practices any hole larger than three quarters of an inch so basically the tip of your finger anything bigger than that we want to make sure it's covered use hardware cloth because they can't peck through that they can't get through that Okay, if you have ledges on your home where birds are congregating, you can use ledge protectors. It's those little bird spikes. You need to make sure the whole ledge is covered. Otherwise, it's not going to do anything. They'll just sit where they can. Um, if you are building a new home, then having ledges at a greater than 45 degree angle will help as well because it's not a comfortable place to perch. Plastic strips say over the opening of a barn door or something, a gazebo, something like that, just hanging down in front. Um, I always compare it to like those freezer things that you have to like walk through, right? Um, we wanna make sure that we are covering gutters so it does not provide an easy nesting area or the eaves of our houses. So there is nice fine netting that you can purchase that you can place. Um, to prevent them from getting up into those eaves, up into those crevices around the roof. It is possible to remove the nests for those three non-native birds. I mentioned that earlier, those sparrows, the starlings, and those pigeons, perfectly fine to remove those. They are not protected, but you need to make sure that those birds belong to those nests, okay? You don't wanna accidentally remove a native bird because one, that's very sad and two, that can get you in trouble. 
Um, standing water is going to be a big draw for some of our pigeons. So if you're having a pigeon problem and you have a water feature in your backyard, that might be something that's attracting them to it something to keep in mind. Uh, we do want to landscape purposefully. So as I mentioned before, these Canada geese love big open lawns. Golf courses are their favorite. So if you have a lot of lawn, putting more native plants, giving it over to prairie is going to attract native birds. And you know, some of our Canada geese, they can, they can go live in those golf courses away from you, okay? Uh, you can also, look into using barriers or fences. Geese and other waterfowl in particular love to nest on islands. So if you have a pond in your neighborhood that has a little island in the middle of it, can you put a fence around the island so that they cannot just swim and then walk up because that's their preferred method. They like to swim up to it and then walk onto the little island. So putting a little fence right there is going to be very, very helpful. Note that a lot of this stuff is going to be more effective if you use it together. So most animals will tolerate one inconvenience. When it's three or four, that's a bit much and they move on, okay? So think about how we can use multiples of these to work together to create an unfriendly environment for these birds that we don't want. You can use gentle aversives so you can do hazing. Hazing is just being really loud and obnoxious every single time you see the animal and scaring them away. You have to be consistent and you have to be persistent about it because they'll try to outlast you, okay? This is true of pretty much all wildlife. Uh, you can use frightening devices. It has been found to work very well with woodpeckers. You can use shiny reflective tape, even pie pins up in like aluminum pie pans um, will scare away. But with some of those more invasive ones, that's gonna be a temporary solution, not necessarily a long-term solution. When you have an established bird, that's when it's time to call in a professional. When you've tried the exclusionary methods and that bird is still there causing problems, if more birds are arriving in the area, if there is that threat to human health due to a buildup of fecal matter, and if they are causing substantial property damage, that's when we really need to call in those professionals and help out. So trapping most birds is illegal without the proper permits and you need to go through the State Department to get those. So typically you're wanna go through a professional if trapping is the way to go. And also trapping doesn't remove the reason the animal's there. So it just kind of invites in a different set of birds, okay? If the attraction is still there, another animal is gonna find it and exploit it. So we wanna focus on removing what's attracting them or excluding them from the attractive space rather than just relocating the animal. We definitely want to avoid tactile or sticky deterrents because those can rip out feathers and cause really bad skin problems and it's not just gonna be for your problem birds, it's gonna be for all birds in the area. So those are highly, highly discouraged. We also never wanna use poisons because when you poison one animal, just like with that DDT, you don't know where the poison is going to end up in the food chain. And it could even be your pets, your children, your neighbors, something like that. So poison is one, highly inhumane. It is very painful. It's not a good way to go definitely want to avoid that one. And again, just a reminder, it is illegal to keep wild animals in your home even for a short time. So please avoid doing that. Even if we have the best intentions, you wanna call a professional rehabilitator. So who can you call to help? Us, DuPage County Animal Services. Now we are responsible for sick and injured wildlife in unincorporated DuPage only. So if you live in a town, then that's where you're going to call your local police department. We'll talk about that next. Now, for us to be able to help, that animal is going to need to be contained or immobilized because we don't want to chase it around and cause additional problems. We cannot set traps. So that is something that you do need those special permits for. We do not have those permits. That's going to be someone else. And if you just have a bird that's not 
causing immediate harm to you if it's just being a nuisance like a woodpecker on you know your siding we're going to give you lots of advice on how to deal with that but that's not something we're going to come and remove if you do have an animal in the living space of the house that's something that we can help with but if they're outside and they're just being annoying that's going to be a whole different story but we are always happy to offer advice so for those who live in town dupage you want to call your local law enforcement some have their own animal control officers on staff those acos and some do not so it really just depends on where you live and what their abilities are uh, sometimes they will actually call us and have us come out but if you live in a town we can't come out there without their invitation okay it's like the fbi and law enforcement we can't just hone in and take over their jurisdiction we have to be invited in Another great resource is the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, and I want everybody to write this website down. It is fabulous. It is www.wildlifeillinois.org, and it will help you with animal identification, damage control and preventative measures, and it is a, just a wealth of fabulous information, not just for birds, but for all wildlife found here in Illinois. Now, if you do have a concern about illegal activity, if someone is illegally trapping wildlife in your area, maybe somebody is harassing those Canada geese on the golf course down the road from you. If you are finding multiple deceased animals and you're concerned about a poisoning situation or a disease outbreak, that would be the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. They are responsible for all wildlife in the state of Illinois. One of those professional rehabilitators we have right here in DuPage County is Willowbrook Wildlife Center. They will only take in native animals. So if you have a sick or injured starling, pigeon, or house sparrow, they will not take that animal in because they are only helping native animals. Uh, their primary goal is to rehab and release back out into the wild, but they do have some space for long-term and permanent care. So they do have uh, some zoo type facilities where you can go and see the animals that are permanent residents there. Now they do not have transportation capabilities. So either if you live in unincorporated, we can transport to them. Sometimes local law enforcement can do that or private citizens, as long as you feel safe and comfortable doing so, you can transport injured wildlife to them as well. Uh, they only have so much space though. So I always recommend calling ahead before you bring an animal just to see what their space and capacity looks like. Uh, there are other wildlife rehabilitators in our area. They're just a little further away. So you can look at the wildlifeillinois.org website to see for additional ones. Also, uh, Humane Society of the United States has great additional advice. Another place right here local to Chicagoland is the Chicago Bird Collision Monitoring Group. It is a completely volunteer run group. It is based in downtown Chicago and they are very concerned with preventing those high rises from causing significant damage to the bird populations, but they will also transport sick or injured birds to rehabilitators like Willowbrook Wildlife. Uh, they have great resources for what you can do to mitigate collisions in your home, much more detailed than what I was able to do tonight. So definitely check out their website if that is a concern you have. And they're always looking for volunteers to monitor migratory birds to do that citizen science work and check out the health and the population of the native and non-native birds in our area. Now, if you are having a situation where it's you have to get rid of a bird in your outside your home, then I would recommend that you talk to a wildlife removal professional. Uh, they deal with nuisance wildlife and especially those starlings, those pigeons and those sparrows when you have large numbers of them, best to leave it up to a professional. Uh, you can find them online through the Wildlife Illinois website, but you wanna make sure that they know what they're doing. So are they scientifically minded? Are they going to look at this in a methodical way so that they can identify 
Entry points, if they're nesting in your attic, how did they get in there? Potential entry points, weak spots are, and then also the number and condition of the animals that they trapped so that you know that the situation has been taken care of and you can fix the problem as soon as all the animals are gone. So definitely ask questions of these wildlife trappers. Don't just let them come in, scoop up some birds and walk away. Ask those questions, find out as much as you can about the situation so you can avoid repeating it in the future. That just gets expensive. Okay, thank you so much for sticking with me, guys. I'm so sorry I went over time. I do, we'll stick around for questions though. So if you have questions, go ahead and throw them into the chat box for me. Uh, real quick, I wanna mention some upcoming webinars that we have. Uh, next week, we'll be doing canine concerns. So behavior problems with our dogs and what to do about them. We'll also provide solutions. How to choose a pet professional, groomers, veterinarians, the whole nine yards is going to be the following Thursday. So the last Thursday of September on the 30th. In October, we are going to a twice a month schedule for our webinars. Uh, the first week and the third week, I believe, is going to be the consistent pattern from now on. So that first week of October is do-it-yourself enrichment. How can we provide wonderful enriching activities for our animals without breaking the bank and that third week in October shed for small animals so shed stands for shelter healthcare, exercise and diet the four necessities for healthy happy pets we'll talk about small animals including guinea pigs hamsters bearded dragons parakeets and more all right so if anybody has any questions I am always available via email. So my email address is humane.education at dupageco.org. If something strikes you later on or if a situation occurs, we are always happy to help and answer questions and point you to further resources. So please feel free to reach out to me. And if there are no questions, then that is all I have for you tonight, folks. Thank you so much for sticking around. I appreciate you guys joining us and I hope I see you next week at our next webinar. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.